Well, welcome to this uh, tutorial, which is going to look at uh, a method of producing the kind of particle smoke effect that was quite popular uh, a few years ago. It's a bit of a cliched effect, but it's still worth knowing how to do. This updates a set of videos I did maybe three or four years ago, uh, looking at how to do that in, I think, Houdini 10. And it's a lot easier in Houdini 11, and I'll demonstrate how you do it. Anyway, uh, this builds on the lesson we had last time on sourcing in particle networks in Houdini. And I've got a, a basic uh, scene set up here. So I've got a path here, this curve, and I've got a sphere that's animated along it. So I'm going to turn off the visibility of the path. So let's have a look at this emitter. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but let's just have a look at what I've set up here. So I'm looking at the geometry spreadsheet for the emitter, and all of the important attributes are at the primitive level. And uh, what I've got here is a set of color attributes, a mass attribute, and a PC attribute. So what I've done is I've divided the object into, I think it's five groups or six groups. And for each group of primitives, I'm giving it a different color and I'm also giving it a different p seed value, that integer value. And the p seed value is going to help us later on when we come to our particle simulation. Uh, as I say, I won't go through how I've set that up uh, because it's pretty basic Houdini stuff. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the mass is being randomized using this attribute wrangle so that it's a function, a random function of that p seed attribute that I just mentioned. So each of those groups of primitives is going to have a, a slightly different mass and each is going to have a different color. So the next thing to do uh, is to start emitting particles from this. So with the object selected, I just go onto my particle shelf. Uh, that's not my particle shelf, that's my particle shelf. And I click the source particles. And this is going to set up my auto dot network. Let's enlarge this so we can see it and hit L to lay it out. So you'll recall that that's, uh, this is the thing that contains the geometry, the particles, and these things are the things that determine their behavior. The first thing I'm going to do is turn off gravity. We don't need gravity to be, to be on. And let's have a look at our source node. So we're emitting from the surfaces of the emitter, and I'm going to increase this say to 50,000. I know that's that's fine. That's not going to tax my computer that much. So that's going to produce 50,000 particles every second. And the attributes here, uh, I'm going to inherit all attributes. So it's going to inherit the color and also that PC attribute and also mass. It's not going to inherit any velocity. And I'm going to turn the variance right down to say 0.2. And we can see that that produces a, a stream of particles which sort of slowly drift apart, and that's because of this variance. That's not a very interesting uh, sort of particle smoke simulation. We're going to need to randomize this a lot more. And there are three things that we can do to introduce a bit of variation into these particles. Uh, we can apply a bit of noise, uh, which I will demonstrate how to do. We will apply a sort of upward motion to the particles. And finally, what we can do is to use the velocity field from a smoke simulation to help displace, uh, to, to help move the particles. Now that last uh, thing I'm going to demonstrate in a, in a separate video. But for the moment, let's demonstrate how to add noise to these particles. Let me rewind the simulation. Uh, and the way we add noise is by laying down a pop force node. Doesn't seem to have come up. Let me look for it here. Pop force. There we go. So the pop force node uh, has a force here, which I'm going to leave at zero. And then it has the ability to add noise. Uh, and this is going to be what we're going to use. So let me enlarge this. So you'll see that at the moment the amplitude of the noise is zero and 
therefore there's going to be no noise applied and no force applied. And what I want to do is vary uh, the noise according both to the sort of time of the simulation, but also which particular group, which particular P-seed attribute each particle has. To do that, I'm going to need to use VEX expressions, so I'll tick this box. And then we get this, this pane open here, which allows us to enter some VEX expressions. Now, the way uh, pop force nodes work, which is a bit different from things like attribute wrangle, where you may have used VEX expressions before, is that instead of using these as attributes, you just use the name without any at symbol in front. So, for example, here, this would be AMP. There's a little helper uh, menu here, which allows you to do various common tasks. I'm going to just set this to pass through for the moment. So as you can see, all of this, do this does is set each of these attributes to itself. So it does nothing, but it does mean that we can come in here and edit these very easily. So in fact, the only one of these that I'm going to edit is the offset. So I'll delete everything else. And the offset I'm going to put equal to a vector because it's, as you can see, uh, a four vector here. So I need a, a set expression. And the set just takes a number of arguments and returns a vector of that length. So in this case, the first component I'm going to put at time. And note that this is with a capital T. And what this is returning is the the time of the simulation. So it's it's just the the time according to the to this in seconds. And then the second thing I'm going to do is at p seed, which is our attribute that we've inherited, times 10. And then I'll leave zero for the rest. So obviously you could play about with this to, to try different variations. The other thing I'm going to need to do is set the amplitude to 1. I'm going to leave everything else at the default. So let's see what's that, what that has achieved. So if I now play the simulation, we can see that the particles are spreading out rather, rather nicely. Now they're spreading out rather too much. So uh, the next thing I might want to do is add a drag node to try and sort of cool down that movement. So let me move these up. And then I need not just a normal drag node, but a pop drag, like so. Uh, and then uh, I can set, let's just leave this at the default at the moment and see, see how that looks. And actually, I think that that works pretty nicely with the default. So you can see we're already getting uh, the beginning of the kind of random particle movement that we would want in these kind of particle smoke simulations. Um, let me just go up and see whether we can see this with the colors. There we are. So we can see it, uh, it's producing a nice sort of diffuse simulation. Uh, there are a couple of other things I want to change here which will help uh, because this ball is, is moving. So if I go into my, oops, if I go into my auto dot network, uh, and you'll recall this from the pop sourcing video, I need to, on this, the birth tab here, I need to set the interpolate source to something forward. Uh, and that will prevent this sort of jittering as we emit the particles. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is set a sort of upward motion. And to do that, I'm going to use a pop wind node. Now, the difference uh, between a pop wind node and a pop force node, and they, they look a bit similar, is that this tries to get the particle to match the velocity in here. Um, so the particle will never travel faster than this velocity, or at least this, this node will never force it to go faster than this velocity. Obviously, if it's a force node, and potentially, potentially it can keep on accelerating and accelerating and getting faster and faster. Here, it will never exceed the velocity given here. And I'm going to give it a value of 2. And then I'm going to use VEX expressions on this as well. And let's use the pass-through menu so we can see what's available. I don't need to change the air resistance. Uh, and instead of just setting the wind equal to something, I'm going to set it to times equal. So that will take 
whatever is here and multiply it by whatever I've got afterwards. And I'm going to have a, a vector again, um, although in fact I could use a float for this. So I'm going to set it to zero. And then I'm going to set it to fit not one. And the fit not one expression uh, or function takes three components. The first one is a value between zero and one. And the second and third values are the upper and lower limits. And it remaps that value that lies between zero and one and remaps it to between the lower and the upper limit. So in this case, of course, I'm going to have a rand at p seed, which is going to make sure we've got a different effect for each of those different bits of the particle simulation. And then the values that I've experimented with and seem to work pretty well are between 0.5 and 3. So that's going to produce a value between 0.5 and 3, and that produces 0. So each sort of set of particles will have the same value of PC, and therefore this expression will amount to the same, but different sets of particles will have a different wind value. And I can increase the effect here by just scaling up this number if I, if I need to. So let's uh, see what that looks like. Uh, let's rewind our simulation. And uh, we can see there's now much more upward movement like that, which looks pretty good, actually. looks quite like a, a sort of simulation in water with, with ink moving upwards. Now, the reason this, is, this effect is called the millions of particle effect is because in order to make it look good, you need to have many millions of particles. And usually you can't simulate all of those particles at once. So what you need to do is run a, a large number of slightly different particle simulations and then combine all the particles together in order to render them. So how can we do this? Well, uh, for first thing, of course, we could increase the emission here. Um, and let me put it up to, say, uh, 150,000. It's going to slow things down quite a bit, uh, but it's going to mean that by the end of the simulation, we're probably going to have a, a million particles or so uh, in the simulation. The thing that sort of changes, makes a difference between one particle simulation and another, is actually a parameter here on this node, which is called the seed parameter here. And if I change the seed, then the scatter function, the exact initial velocities, everything will change so that the particles, although it'll look fairly similar, the particles will be in slightly different positions. And when you combine them together, uh, you'll get a, um, a richer set of particles. So what we need to do is do a number of, of simulations uh, with a birth rate uh, that's quite high and we need to save them to disk. Now we could do this manually by sort of varying each of these, but that would be very boring. Fortunately, Houdini has a way to achieve this automatically, and we need to go into the out section to create some things. So we see we've got a default render node, and I need a geometry node. And uh, what I need to do is to take the default here and I need to change it a bit. This is going to render out our geometry to this path here so it's going to put it in the geo directory hip name dollar os which is the name of this node geometry one dollar f which is the frame and then bgo and the sop path I'm rendering is in fact the source particles geo uh, and if you remember the source particles geo is is just the node which imports the particle simulation so that you can render it. So this will be just the particles all together. But there's something I want to do just before I render uh, that out, um, which is to go into the source particles node, and we want to delete any extra data because this is going to take up a lot of space on disk, and we want to delete anything uh, that we don't need. And you probably can't see, but we've got quite a lot of attributes here and we don't need them all, so I'm going to put down an attribute delete. And what I can do is I can just delete everything, which was the star, and then I can put a caret sign, and that will save some things from that general rule of deleting everything. So I'm going to save the color, 
the position and the velocity. I think that's in fact all I need. So if we have a look at our geometry spreadsheet now on the particles, we can see we've got color, velocity, and that's it. That's just group information. So we've we've successfully deleted a lot of information that we don't need. So back to the out tab. So if I if I just render this, it's just going to render things with the default settings that I've got in the simulation right now. And I want to change that over time. And the way to do that is to use a wedge node. And a wedge node is something that renders some other render node, in this case this geometry node, multiple times, each time changing a value in in this case the simulation. So let's look at how we set that up. So in the wedge node the first thing we need to do is we need to select an output driver and that's the thing that we're going to render multiple times. So in this case it's this geometry driver and it's going to, when it renders it multiple times, it's going to create a, a variable dollar geometry which, uh, sorry, dollar wedge which will be usable here in this output file name. So for example I could put after the hit name and it's a good idea to put this up front rather than at the end uh, the dollar wedge. And then going back to the wedge node I've got a prefix and then it's going to change some value uh, a number of times. And you can either do this by assigning a, a random value or you can do it by just stepping through a series of values which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to turn off random samples and then it asks for a wedge parameter. So what parameter is going to vary as we render this multiple times. So I'll increase this to 1 and then I can make a name and I'm going to call it seed. Let's turn caps off, seed. And now we need a channel. And this is a reference to a parameter in our seed. So let me go back to our auto.network and then on our source. One easy way to get the address of this is to click copy, copy the parameter. And then uh, when we go back to our wedge node, we can paste reference. And this is going to produce this uh, CHS channel here. And what we're actually going to do is just take away everything around the brackets there and just leave the, the sort of path to that parameter. And for the purpose of this, I'm going to render it 10 times. And rather than ranging the seed between 0 and 1, I'm going to copy the number of steps here and paste a relative reference and then take one away. And the reason I'm doing that is because it will then use whole numbers for the seed. So the first time it runs it will use a seed value of 0, the next time 1, the time after that 2, right up until the final time it runs when it will use the value of 9. And that's going to be rather useful later on as we will see. So when I click render on this it's going to repeatedly render out that geometry node and this will take about 10 minutes perhaps to run through. So I'm actually not going to hit render now. I'm, I'm going to pause the video and show you the results. Uh, but in fact before we do that uh, there's a small error on the geometry node here which is that we're just rendering the current frame and we need to render the frame range. And in fact uh, what I'm going to do to save time is just render the last 20 or so frames of the simulation. The, the full simulation is 100 frames uh, and that way we'll save a bit of disk space. So if I go to the wedge node, render wedges, uh, we can see that this starts working through and I'm going to pause the video at this point. So that's now finished rendering. And I want to now get rid of the display of these particles. I probably want to turn off the emitter display as well. I'm going to hit L to lay out these nodes. 
and now I need a container uh, which is going to bring in all of those cached files that I've just rendered out. So let's call this, say, all particles. Now, in older versions of Houdini, accumulating all of those particles and rendering them was quite a complica complicated process involving procedural shaders. Fortunately, since um, the, in the addition of packed geometry to Houdini, we can use packed geometry rather neatly to achieve what we want. So what I'm going to do is lay down a file merge node. And I'm not sure when this was introduced uh, to Houdini, but it's perfect for accumulating a number of different groups of, of files. So let me open this up and let's have a look in our geo directory. And we're showing the sequences as one entry. So if I just move this over here, uh, what we can see is we've got um, some files which allow us to load in all of those frames that we've rendered out. And you can see here it's got this prefix wedge seed 0, wedge seed 1, wedge seed 2, wedge seed 3, wedge seed 4, and so on. And each of these will have the appropriate number of frames. So we've got 10 different variations of, of, the, of the simulation. And we can bring these in. Let me just pick one of these, like so. So this is just going to pick uh, one of the wedge values, in this case zero. Uh, but I can add a variable here called slice. And the slice will then change and it will repeat the number of times given here. So let me just add in slice. So where I need to put the slice is dollar slice here, like so. And now uh, I need to take it from a value of zero to a value of 9 with a step of 1. And what we should find, uh, second, ah, oh, we have to be at frame 80, of course, because there's no, there's no data in earlier frames. There we go. So at frame 80, because uh, we've now got, we only rendered out frame 80 to, 80, 80 to 100, we can see that, in fact, there's 5.25 million polygons. Now my system has a reasonable amount of memory so it's coping with having 5.25 million polygons uh, but if you wanted 50 million polygons it would probably collapse uh, and yet you do want to render 50 million polygons and this is where pack primitives come in because uh, the parameters down here allow us to decide how we're going to load this geometry and at the moment we're actually loading all of the the points. If we change this to packed disk primitive, right, we just get a bounding box. And we can right click on this. Uh, in fact, you, you can't see. Let me swap this up. Right, if we middle click rather on this, we can see that at the moment it's taking 140 kilobytes. That's because all of our data, all those many millions of particles, are actually just staying on disk. They're not being loaded in. But when we come to render the scene, the render will recognize that what we've got here is a packed primitive, and it will unpack it, and it'll render all of those points uh, for us. So to start with, uh, let me swap this back, and let me set up a very simple shader. So I'm going to use a constant shader, if I can find it, somewhere down here. There we are. So a constant shader, and I don't know, let's give it a sort of light blue color. And we're going to apply this with a, to our particles. So this is what we're going to render. So let's give it that material. And we're also going to set up a new render node. So let me do that. And when rendering particles of this kind, it is marginally more efficient to render them using the 
phys the sorry the micro polygon rendering method because the shading is pretty simple and it allows some optimizations to happen. I don't yet, I think, do I have a camera set up? Yes, I do. So if I take a frame like 84, we should be able to render this and see what we get. I'll pause the video while it's rendering out. Well, this is partially rendered uh, and we can see there's a bit of an issue here because our particles are turning up as, as quite large blobs. And the reason for that is that on our object node, which we're rendering, the All Particles node, uh, we need to set something here on the Render tab. And this is Geometry sub-tab. If we have a look down here, uh, there are a couple of things, two or three things that we need to change. So the first is that we want to render only points. And the second is that, for the purpose of this, I want to render them circles, not as spheres. And then finally, I'm going to change the point scale to something else. And in this case, I'm going to change it to 0.4, and I'm going to re-render that and see what we get. You can see that looks a bit more like it. We can play about with this scale according to the scale of your scene. But this looks rather flat, and the reason for that, well, there are a couple of reasons for that, one of which is that in general you want to use a very low alpha value so that the particles, you can see the particles behind the particles at the front. And secondly, you probably want some lighting in here. Let me just demonstrate the first. So let's take our constant shader and take the opacity right down to 0.1. And I'll pause again. And that's not fully rendered, but we can already see it's looking a bit more interesting. The other thing that you probably want to do is add some lighting to your scene. And that's where things get difficult. Because uh, the rendering of all of these particles, particularly if I had uh, you know, 5 million, but 50 million particles in here, it takes a long time to render those if they if they're, have a very low alpha value. You're having to process every single particle. And if you need to have a light and to have shadows, then you're going to have to do that twice. You do it once uh, when you're creating your shadow map and once when you render the particles. And that increases render times enormously. So what I'm going to show you is a bit of a cheat for how to render the particles with a shader, a light which is using a, a cheat on the shadows. But I'm going to do that in the next video.